Hi everybody, it's um, Father Ed Wade with you. It's October 6th, almost 1 o'clock in the afternoon. Uh, I wasn't planning on doing a video today, but I was over at the University of Houston this past week at the Newman Center and I was asked to say Mass. And afterwards I heard some confessions and some of the kids were coming in. Obviously I can't tell you what they said, but one of the one of the kids afterwards was mentioned a question to me about how do you deal with people who hold different value systems against us? And he was she was specific on the whole idea of homosexuals, rampant homosexuals. And she was telling me what's going on on the campus is not just um, more and more support of homosexual activity and marriage between uh, homosexuals, lesbians, but also transgenderism and how to handle it caught me by surprise and uh, we shared and talked. I gave her some ideas and I thought it was over at that until I was asked to go over again today and say mass again for the students, uh, which I did. And I looked at the readings and the readings, today's gospel was taken from um, chapter uh, Mark's gospel, chapter 10, verses 2 to 16. And one of the priests had asked me uh, to preach. And I looked at the readings and I said, oh, my God, it was Jesus talking on marriage. And uh, I'll read this one quote, he said. You can pick it up again. It's Mark chapter 10, verses 2 to 16. He says this, By, but from the beginning of creation, God made them both male and female. And for this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh, so that there are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, no human being must separate. That's pretty clear, isn't it? That Jesus just wasn't saying it to a contemporary question, but he was also going back and reviewing the Ten Commandments. And it really struck me, uh, what we're living in today is a cultural battle. But as one of the students said to me, uh, said, and I've been away from the university campus. I did seven years at the Franciscan University of Steubenville in youth ministry. And uh, it, it's, uh, but it's changing. Now it's everything. It's transgenderism with uh, Bruce Jenner, now Caitlyn Jenner. And to me, it's still Bruce Jenner. I don't care what, what, what operation or anything. He's still Bruce. God created him a man. He's a man. And no law, no law coming from the Supreme Court or from the President of the United States or the Congress is going to change anything. God's, man's law does not trump God's law. It just doesn't happen. Now, in the state it might, but not, a, not in the overall, overall view of God's plan for man and humanity and what have you. I'm clear on that. And I don't get that. I mean, obviously, I believe it because I'm a Catholic priest, right? That's why I wear the Roman collar to make sure everybody realizes this guy's really a Catholic priest. But I, I, I believe it because the Catholic Church teaches it because I, believe, I have the faith of the Catholic, Catholic Church. But also I believe it because I see it through reason that I'm able to, without, without Scripture and without the teaching of the Church, use reason to look at a male and female. And you don't have to be a rocket scientist to begin to realize that that's natural. There's a complementarity that exists between male and female. It doesn't exist between two men or two women. It just doesn't exist. Biologically, it doesn't exist. And so, and even in the animal kingdom, when we look within the animal kingdom, it's always male and female. You look at fish feeding through the ocean, it's always male and female uh, in their species. So, uh, to, in this society today, it seems like, uh, you know, the, the expression I use is a movie I saw years ago with Jack Nicholson called One Flew Over the Cuckoo, Cuckoo's Nest. And it's really true. The inmates have taken over the asylum in this country and in the world. And, and many times the United Nations and the governing bodies because we've lost the ability to think clearly and we're buying into the women caprice of a, a lot of, um, no, I don't want to put the finger on anybody, philosophers and God forbid in some cases theologians and in some cases even the clergy Watch what happens at the Senate this year, this year starting uh, today. What's going on and the rumors that are going back and forth about 
a certain group of bishops or priests trying to do things against the church. Who knows what's going to happen? But keep it in your prayers. Keep it in your prayers. But there's no doubt in my mind that the marriage as we know it is definitely under attack. Okay, now with that said, I think we can all agree with that. And depending what political spectrum you're on, or religious spectrum on, you're going to come at a certain position. Me, I come from a Judeo-Christian position. I'm a Catholic priest, 42 years, uh, a philosophy student at the Catholic University of America, and just study, and just common, to me, it's common sense. Uh, you know, I don't need, as I said before, I'm repeating myself here, the church to tell me this, although I subscribe to it. But it's through reason and thinking and clearly thinking that there's something wrong. And so we're living in the an age of what is commonly called political correctness. Now, what political correctness? That to me is a cancerous tumor in this world that we live in. A political correctness, you don't want to you don't want to offend anybody. Well, you know, I'm looking at it saying, well, you know, Jesus offended people. Why do you think he was crucified? Why do you think Jesus was crucified? He offended people. He offended people that didn't like being offended. And so they crucified him. The kangaroo court trial, he was killed. He was crucified. Why do you think Peter had his, uh, was crucified upside down? Because he didn't offend people? He offended people. Why do you think Paul, St. Paul, had his, had, his, um, had, was, had his head chopped off? Because he didn't offend people? He offended people. Why do you think the Christians, through Nero and, and the Roman emperors, put the Christians into the Colosseum where they were devoured and beaten by and eaten alive by wild animals because they didn't offend people? They did offend people. There's something about the gospel and the message of Jesus Christ that offends people, especially those that don't want to hear it, that those that resent it, that choose to live in the darkness rather than the light. But for those who accept Jesus as the Messiah and Lord, they become his disciples and his friends. But there's a price to pay. There's a price to pay when we say we're Christian. And it's going to be, we're going to go against the world. So I got two quotes because... One of the things this young student mentioned was, uh, you know, the, uh, you know, the phobia, homophobia. So let me give you a definition right out of the dictionary. Oh, I'm going to read this. A phobia is an extreme or irrational fear of an adversary or something. Irrational fear. Notice I wore the word irrational. You're irrational. You have a phobia. Or, Homosexual phobia is a dislike or prejudice against homosexual people. Now, I I I love these people. I don't I don't have a problem with people. I don't have a problem with them. I don't dislike them. I don't. Uh, there's no irrational fear. I have a problem with their behavior. I have a problem when a man sodomizes another man. I have a problem with that. I don't think that's normal. And I'm not a rocket scientist. I don't think that's normal for a man to do what he does to another man. And then to try to con me into believing that's normal activity. I know that men and women are a natural complementarity. But that what happens is those who are opposed it keep on telling you, you know, you got a phobia, you got a phobia. I don't have a phobia. I don't have, I'm not afraid of you or I'm not afraid or dislike you but I have a real problem with your behavior. And I know God loves you and God made you in his image and likeness and he wants you to come to heaven. But I know that you're doing things that really can predetermine where you're going to spend eternity. So I love you enough to be able to speak to this and speak the truth to it. I would say the same thing with two women who were in lesbian affairs. You know, but it's common. I go into doctor's offices. I pick up magazines like People Magazine. I try to read and all of a sudden, they're using marriage like two women married one another. This is her husband. This is, and they're two women, and one's a husband and one's a man. And I'm thinking to myself, this is really one's flew over the cuckoo's nest. Now I know there'll be people that really resent me saying this, and uh, I'm sure this uh, this goes viral. But I'm living at the point now, especially when I read uh, Ezekiel chapter two. Son of man, I tell you to say something. Read Ezekiel two. And he tells you, and I tell you to say something, and you don't say it, because, and people are lost because you don't say it. I hold you accountable. And, you know, I really took that seriously when I heard that. And I'm thinking, geez, I wasn't ordained. I'm not running for public office. I'm here to get myself into heaven. I want to go to heaven. 
I know I'm going to die. I don't know how much gas I have left in the tank. I don't know whether I have two days, two weeks, two months, two years. I don't know. I've been a preacher for 40, 42 years. I'm on, the, I'm on the last circuit of the track. But I'm figuring while I'm alive, I want to do everything I can to bring the truth of what I believe is the good news of salvation, the, new, the gospel, the new Pentecost, the baptism of the Holy Spirit, the renewal of our minds, and so that we become sons and daughters of God to help people who are held in bondage to what I believe is addictive compulsive behavior. And this is active homosexual activity. That's my belief system. That's my belief system. And so I say this because, again, who are you going to listen to? And look, this is where the rubber hits the road. Who do you listen to? Who are you going to put your money on? The Supreme Court that says this is, this is, this is allowed? Or the states or, or the, president, the government of the United States or this, uh, uh, the United Nations? Who are you going to believe in? The cultural clash is here. It's not coming. It's here. And people are going to be given the choice of making choices and decisions. And so I think it's, an, it's, it's urgent that we priests from the pulpit, from the confessional, in public conversation, start to speak the truth and not be afraid. Are we going to be disliked? You bet your sweet bippy we are. Because they don't, people, some people don't want to hear it. Well, they may leave. Well, let them leave. Open the door and help them out if that's what they're going to do. Oh, they may not give money. Well, maybe they won't give money. But, you know, so what? So what? Like the Lord wants to purify his church. He wants a bride that's pure. He wants a bride that's clean. And so that's up to us, I think, initially, we priests and we bishops and we ministers and parents and lay people and teachers to stand up and be counted. Our silence we got to stop being silent. Silence is no lo- silence is silence is really speaking out, but not saying anything. Because when you say nothing, it gives complicit to the yes of what these people are trying to say and try to sell me. I'm not going to put up with that anymore. I'm not going to put up. With that. First of all, because I got to know I'm going to stand before God sooner rather than later, and I'm going to have to give an accounting of what I did or what I didn't do as a priest. And I made a lot of mistakes in my life. And I've repented, and I hope God in his mercy forgives me. But I'm, not, I'm, I'm doing my best to be trust in him and believe in him. And so, therefore, that's what I, what I said to um, uh, the college students that I was speaking to the other day and a group of young people over at the Catholic Charismatic Center this past week. It's called DIG, about 30 teenagers. And I said the same thing to them. And, you know, the beautiful thing is that the kids are just looking at me and they're going like this. They know. Not because I'm telling them. These kids know what the truth is. And what surprises me, they walk up and they want to hear it more. They want to hear it from the pulpit. They want to hear it from the priests, the ministers. They want to hear it from the nuns, the school teachers. They want to hear it. And so, Lord Jesus, I thank you for the opportunity of giving me this time to be on uh, Facebook. And I ask your blessings upon everybody watching this. I, I pray especially also for all my brothers and sisters who suffer and who are experiencing these desires, these uh, lesbian desires and homosexual desires. Lord, I pray for their healing. I pray that you, you heal them and set them free to live in the freedom of their sexuality as men and as women, to experience mutual complementarity between the male and female. I pray also, Lord God, for those who are confused by this transgender um, gobbledygook that's going out now, where you can you you are what you say you are. If you think you're a pig, you're a pig. If you think you're a, a cocker spaniel, you're a cocker spaniel. You can be whatever you want to be. It's what you th- say you are. Forget that there's objective truth about anything. You can be what you want to be. You make up your own truth. Baloney, b a l b a l n o e y, baloney. You are made in the image and likeness of God. That's who you are. And I don't need anybody to affirm to me who I am. I know who I am. I'm a son of God. I'm his son. I'm a man who happens to be a priest. And I accept that. I don't want to be a woman. I love being a man. I love being a priest. I love doing what I'm doing. God the Father, I ask your blessings upon all my friends out there in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.